Welcome to Lisa's Podcast, hosted by Zach Schwartz. Uh, today's episode is the second episode of our Oscar movie review series. And despite Uncut Gems, starring Adam Sandler, not being nominated for an Oscar, I am including it in this series because uh, you always have to stick up for your Jewish brothers in Adam Sandler. <laughs> so today joining me to break down Uncut Gems is Salvador Corona. Sal, how are you doing in warm Florida? I'm good, I'm good. Keeping, keeping cool inside in this quarantine but yeah i'm excited to break down this this crazy movie yeah. no beaches for you like the rest of our uh, generation down there no no everything? no i'm 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 trying to be smart about it and not being stupid floridian and try to make the quarantine last longer by being outside there we go that's a medical school worthy statement right there if you ask me that was, that was brilliant <laughs> Uh, so Uncut Gems was released in December of 2019, had a budget of only $19 million, uh, box office of $50 million, so doubled its money pretty easily, directed by Josh and Benny Safdie. It, it looks like a simple last name here on my notes, but I'm not sure if that's how you say that. Um, <laughs> no, I, think, I think you have it right. I've, I've listened to people say it, so they pronounce it like that, Safdie. Good. Uh, you know, pronunciation is not my uh, strong suit. So, <laughs> and the main cast starring Adam Sandler is Howard Ratner. This is rough. Lakeith Stanfield as his assist- assistant, uh, Damani Julia Fox as Julia, his Adam Sandler's girlfriend in the movie, and Kevin Garnett as his big basketball loving self, with cameos by Mike Francesca and The Weeknd because of the New York vibes. Uh, very interesting movie, I should say, from the start. Uh, just looking looking at that cast, uh, Adam Sandler coming back with a movie that is very serious in nature and not like his past comedies and stuff like that. What did you think going into this movie, you know, looking at all that, seeing some of the trailers and stuff like that? So by seeing some of the trailers, I knew this wasn't going to be one of those typical Adam Sandler movies, like his comedies that he does it was going to be more of an intense movie, but I was more intrigued to see how he would adapt to this role. But I did not expect this at all. Even from like the opening scene of the movie, I did not expect it to shape out the way it did. There we go. Perfect transition. So in the opening scene, so I was looking at the Wikipedia today for this, and it turns out that the Ethiopians that are seen mining the gem or uncutting the gem, if you will, uh, the opal of the title of the movie, are Jewish because, of course, they are. I, I don't know oh, yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you notice that in the movie? I didn't. <laughs> didn't, didn't they? He said it later on, right? They're he like, might have. Yeah, he said they were black Jews. Oh, I think that's what he said. I I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I don't know, politically incorrect by referring to them as that, but I'm pretty sure he, he, Adam Sandler called them that in the movie. Well, if Adam Sandler says it about another Jew, it's okay. Black Jews are pretty rare, so it makes sense that they'd be in the movie. (laughs) My dad uh, shook his head at that one. Uh, so we get that scene, and then we get an intro into Adam Sandler's character, Howard Ratner. Uh, he wakes up in his apartment in New York uh, with a younger girl who it turns out is his girlfriend uh, named Julia, who also works for him, uh, despite him having kids and a family whom she is, he's getting a divorce with his wife after Passover. So not only is Adam Sandler Jewish, his character is also Jewish, which is perfectly on brand uh, for him. His wife's name is Dinah, that, all, that whole kind of thing. So right from the get-go, we get introduced to this character as chaotic. Uh, you know, his life is chaotic. He is the owner of a jewelry store. And such like that, and you think the pacing of this movie is really an important um, aspect to it. You want to talk about that a little bit, just the nature of it? Yeah, it's it's it started very fast paced from the start. Just like they incorporated so much drama from like like you said that that scene where he walks into his apartment with um, and he has like there's a bunch of like girls in the bed, and from that it's like starting quick, and then it goes from him, well that one scene where he was like he's a uh, well, it actually starts from the when they were mining for the opal, and then like it does that weird transition, and he's in a getting a colonoscopy, and then That's it like right. switches, and then he has to go back to work. So it's very fast paced, 
and it really I think it's important for this movie because of the dramatics that are involved with him and all the crazy stuff he does. It gives it a New York flavor too, with that yeah. like chaotic energy, the hustle sure. and bustle. Right. So Kevin Garnett, a uh, former basketball player, Boston Celtic, comes into the jewelry store and becomes transfixed by this opal, uh, this gem that uh, Howard Ratner, M. Sailor's character, has purchased. And I believe How- Howard loans it to him for the playoff game against the Sixers in 2012. So the movie is all set during these basically a week or a couple days in uh, 2012 yeah. with this uh, playoff series in adjacent along with it. Um, so that all happens. So he's going to sell this Opal eventually at auction. He loans it to Kevin Garnett. Then there's a whole subplot from that of Kevin Garnett uh Keeping it too long, and I love I love Am Sandler throughout the whole movie. He's like KG, yeah, we're, we're yeah. KG. <laughs> so uh, great New York accent there. Um, eventually, we learned that Adam has some Howard, sorry, has some issues with gambling, and the fact that he is owing a hundred thousand dollars of gambling debt to these couple mob guys. We don't really get too much characterization of them. Uh, he gets ambushed at a school play. He gets ambushed after the auction. It's a, it's a repeated thing of this gambling debt. And I guess I, I missed it, but he was saying this Opal could have cost uh, um, or been sold for a million dollars, correct? At the beginning? Yeah. That's what he kept yeah. going on and on about? Yeah, that's what he said at first um, when he got when he like got the Opal and um and when KG was fell in love with it, KG wanted to buy it straight away from him. But he's like, no, I can't sell this. I need it for an auction because he thought that it was going to go for that amount of money in the auction. But he said this at a, with his own appraisal. He still had to get it appraised by like official gem appraiser. Right. And then his assistant I mentioned before, uh, Damani knows Kevin Garnett will not, somehow cannot get the uh, gem back despite its very high lucrative price on the market. Uh, eventually, Adam Howard Ratner goes to the weekend uh, little show, which back in 2012, the weekend wasn't that big of a deal yet, I suppose. I don't really follow his music. I'm not sure when he blew up. And it turns out the weekend is Snorting Girlfriend with a... Or Snorting Girlfriend. Snorting <laughs> Coke. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a weird scene. Uh, snorting cocaine with his girlfriend, uh, Howard Ratner's girlfriend, which causes a fight. They break up. So about halfway through the movie, you know, it seems like Howard's life is truly falling apart, and that eventually it's setting up for, for me in my mind at least, it was setting up for a redemption arc in the second half of the movie. What'd you think? Yeah, no, I agree. Well, the whole movie, he's trying to cover cover his tracks with. By starting a new problem, it's like a never-ending issue of him, like trying to solve a problem by creating another one. So, like, like you said, it's it creates a sense of like he's gonna figure it out eventually. Right. So then, eventually, the he does get Kevin Garnett does give the opal back. It goes to auction. He has somebody bid up the price of the opal. I believe his father-in-law because the appraisal comes in 10 times lower, which uh, seems like a massive error if you really think it's going to yeah. go for a million and it comes in at around $150,000. Um, and so then right after that gets sold and that gets all messed up, he gets beat up again by the gambling guys. And then he, his girlfriend comes into the shop, sees how sad he is, how beat up he is, and they fix things up, which is a nice love story. Um, and then eventually Kevin Garnett comes in and basically like lays the smack down on him. It kind of says what we're thinking during the course of the movie says, what are you doing? Like, yeah. I want this. You have someone been up against me to buy it. And then eventually Kevin Garnett does buy it for $175,000. And I want to remind everyone, Howard's character at this point owes a hundred grand. So right here, the movie could end. You know, this could be it. It all works out. Everything's fine. If it ended here, it wouldn't have been a great movie per se, but this is where I feel like the logical character would, uh, would wrap this up, but it, it does not get wrapped up here. <laughs> no, it just gets started. So, uh, this isn't necessarily, it, it becomes a little bit, um, present throughout the movie, but not necessarily hitting you in the face. With it. It's more of his poor decisions, but it, Howard's a compulsive gambler, uh, and funny enough, Mike Francesca, the New York radio legend, is his bookie. <laughs> yeah, that's things. funny. 
So Howard takes this $175,000 in cash that he gets from Kevin Garnett and bets it all on Game 7 of the Boston-Philadelphia game going that night because Kevin Garnett is transfixed by this Opal and is going to play very well. And it's funny how they went back and they did the bets to be where uh, they were totals you know, of Kevin Garnett's during the game and stuff like that because we, we checked it out. like It was all real. It wasn't yeah, a made-up game. You know, They used real footage. Uh, so the three... Uh, mob guys come to collect because he finally has the money and he puts all $175,000 in this game. Once again, like you just said, making more problems yeah. uh, than he needs to. So he ends up locking the three gambling guys up into this. Li- I guess since it's a jewelry shop, he has kind of like a holding center. So they're in there. Yeah. They're all watching the game together. And amazingly, Howard's, Howard's bet wins $1.2 million. <laughs> Uh, which is shocking. The girlfriend is super excited. Yeah, Julia's super excited. She's the one collecting the bet due to the guys being in the jewelry store uh, locked in there with Howard. Um, so <laughs> this is the most shocking point of the movie. If you want to describe it, you can. Uh, it comes right when he wins. What happens next? <laughs> so, so yeah, he wins. And like this whole movie... We haven't really talked. We we kind of I talked about it, but like it's very fast paced. Like, like yes. it it's the the it's a very like accelerating rhythm. It has you like extremely anxious all throughout. There's never like a moment where you're like, oh, okay, I can chill out for a bit. You kind of like need like a halftime in this movie because it's it's just so much going on. But yes, at the end he finally he like he wins the bet he gets uh 1.2 million dollars so he wins that bet and his girlfriend's collecting it he kind of just like sigh of relief like oh, okay good like the movie's ending he got his money he's gonna pay off his debts like he's gonna be happily ever after with his girlfriend and then um he he let he lets the people out the game the three gambling guys the mob guys from the little holding cell in his jewelry store and then they like one of the main guys. I don't know if they said his name or I forgot his name. He just kind of like starts getting confrontation confrontational at him and just pulls out a gun and kills him. <laughs> Shoots him in the head. Shoots him in the head and just like that, the movies are and we're all like, "What the heck just happened here? How how does this even happen?" Yeah, the uh, the mob guy that shoots him is Phil. Okay, that's so, yeah. I forgot his name. Phil, according to Wikipedia, Phil shoots him in the head. Yeah, and it's. I think my jaw hit like 40 feet below the floor because like you said, we, we you know, it, it's not the most compelling ending to a movie. You know, when the good guy, when the guy overcomes, gets his money, gets out of it, all that stuff. And the guy just shoots him in the forehead. Yeah. And we were all like, what just happened? And you know, leading up to this, I mean, it makes sense. Obviously they're mob guys. They're pissed. The guy just locked him in there for three hours to watch a basketball game. And I mean, you could collect the money anyway. It doesn't matter to them. Um, sure. it's just, it's funny to me because it's not funny, but like part of the thing <laughs> the movie is that like Howard's character doesn't have any, like he wants to pay off the debt. Right. But he doesn't have like, if he wanted to do that, if that was his primary motivation, he could have just done it right there after he sold the old yeah. Instead, you know, he's such a compulsive gambler that he had to bet it. It's not like he was trying to make a million dollars. That wasn't a stated goal throughout the throughout the movie. He just compulsive and ended up uh, yeah. him killing it. He wanted more. The, yeah, and then the movie ends with the girlfriend having the money, uh, not knowing that uh, Howard's dead yet. So, and then the rest of the mob guys loot the store, and that's that's it. Yeah, it's such a yeah, like you said, an ending. We, I don't know because throughout the whole movie, you're kind of rooting for Howard, and anytime he does something that I don't know, you're like, don't do that, don't do that, don't don't place this bet, don't gamble this, don't do that. But then at the end, you're like, okay, he can, we can finally have a have a win for Howard, and then he he just gets shot. It's crazy. Right. And one other. Go ahead. One other thing that I quite didn't understand, and I didn't look this up prior to this podcast, but one of the like gambling mob guys who had who's related to him in a sense, I didn't really understand his role. Like why they're do you, do you know who I'm talking about? I forget his name too. Yeah, let me let me pull yeah, up the, here. Right? When they're when they're on the Passover um, dinner. And they kind of have an interaction there, but I don't quite get 
like why they don't like each other, like why the the one um the guy that's related to Howard who's in the mob doesn't help him out or anything. That's 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 kind of one of the relationships in the movie that I wanted more more content to it because there's a lot of things that I feel like this movie could have gone probably another half an hour and I would have been completely fine with it. But there's some stuff that needs a little bit more explanation to to it. Right. So according to Wikipedia, you're talking about Arno, who is his brother-in-law, but his okay. job is a loan shark. So that's probably why, because it's like oh. his like uh, life. And after he, after Phil kills Howard, um, he kills Arno too, I believe. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At the yeah. end too. So I guess they both end up dead. But I agree with you. If there's one critique of this movie, we can start getting into our questions here. It's that. It's like you said, like you need a halftime. It's so, you know, chaotic. I couldn't imagine watching this in the theater. I mean, my yeah. blood pressure would have gone through the roof. <laughs> and that if they had an extra 15 minutes, half hour to have some slow play, you know, flesh out. Uh, so a couple of these, not necessarily main characters, because Howard, we get a good understanding of Kevin Garnett, even Damani, we get a good, we get a good understanding yeah. of. But to flesh out, you know, the Bob guys a little bit more, or the his random, you know, father in law that comes in and starts to uh, help him with the auction, or the his yeah. wife even that they're just getting a divorce, and she's there's one scene where they talk and then they're rude to each other and that's it. So it's like, all right, well, there, there's that. So I agree with you. It could use a little bit more runtime, even though movies these days. Uh, are so long. Uh, we just watched Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and goodness, that was two forty. Yeah, uh, it was this too one's long. Only, <laughs> this one's only two fifteen. So yeah, it could definitely have used at least another fifteen minutes. I think. Yeah. So, to my knowledge, this is Kevin Garnett's first time, you know, as a prominent actor in a movie. Uh, I thought he did pretty well. I give him a solid B in his performance. Oh, yeah. yeah, I completely agree. Because like for him. Prior to this, I didn't think he had an interest of being an actor or playing in any movies. Like some NBA players have shown interest to, but he played very well. And it's obvious people are going to say, "Well, he played himself." Of course, he played well, but it's harder than it than it's than it looks to play yourself in a movie. He did he he really like played himself well. Yeah, I agree completely. I. I thought it was interesting too, coming in from you know being a uh, with him being a Celtic and a Boston guy before that playing in Minnesota, coming into this movie with a New York f- flavor, and then he's playing against the Sixers. So you have Boston and Philadelphia, but the movie's all set in New York. So New York. I thought that was right. So I thought that was really interesting, and I, I thought he he did it pretty well, obviously. And because you know, with him, you know, with his NBA career, you know, we're both big NBA fans, and there's uh, some NBA content we've talked about that we're gonna we're gonna get working on soon. Uh, tease that for the fans, but <laughs> <laughs> that he's a very intense player, you know, a very intense, know it all, fiery guy, and a lot of times that doesn't translate per se to the actor, you know, scene, except for. A couple small roles, and this was not a small role by any sense of the imagination. He's probably the third, fourth most important character in the movie. So yeah. I thought it was really interesting, one, that he was even cast for this, uh, talking about those city differences. I know you have – you saw some articles uh, that talk about that on why that that occurred, but also him playing himself in a more fleshed-out role than I would imagine he could have ever gotten in a movie. Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, so the Safdie brothers, they they – they grew up in New York, New York City. They um, big Knicks fans, and they wanted this movie to um, be um, be in New York City. Like they they wanted it to that to be like the main thing. But so when they were looking for an NBA star to throw into their movie, there's not many great New York Knicks players at the time. <laughs> and this was ten years ago. Still, when like the Knicks were had, I guess some. Um, talent um when they because this movie was took 10 years in the making to to come about so they originally had amari stoudemire they reached out to him and um amari agreed to it and then i guess the agency that picked up the movie um went to came to the safety brothers and said 
I think we need to have a bigger guy like to draw in more of an audience than Amari Stoudemire. Um, and, and the brothers are like, yeah, Amari's cool, but we agree. So then obviously they didn't have any other bigger stars than Amari in New York in, for the Knicks. So then they're like, okay, let's try to, ex- bit of, let's try to ex- expand and maybe make it a bit of a reach. So then some names that were thrown out, I, Kobe Bryant was in the mix for, um, for a few for a few months i think and they were trying to work it out with him but then obviously like him being in la it was kind of the stretch of him them trying to involve him in the movie and then i think i saw something that he wanted to be have more of a director role instead of an actor role in this movie so then they parted ways with that and and then so they went back to the chopping block trying to figure out who who to incorporate in this movie and they went to joel and because they wanted that Philly connection because since they couldn't get a New York person, they're like, I guess someone in Philly is close enough. So then they went to Joel and B and they actually wanted to have a bigger role for Joel since the, like the whole like mining and opal thing was based in Africa. They wanted to kind of do a whole little connection where like the opal gives, um, Joel and B some sort of like strength and power that that he put regained through the, like acquiring this opal, but then that didn't work out because it ran into the NBA season. So they're like, oh, scratch that. We need to find another another NBA player. So then they got they got a list of like retired NBA players, and um, luckily they they came across Kevin Garnett. And they were able to establish the connection that he played in the playoffs versus the 76ers in 2012. And then they brought him into the mix. And it worked, it worked out pretty well for them. So I have the 2012 New York Knicks pulled up because I was curious about the Amari thing. First of all, if Amari were in this movie, as some NBA fans would know, are we sure he could have walked across the, uh, the, the jewelry <laughs> store floor with how bad his knees got? <laughs> it was great so this time. Is. But uh okay, what one, one quick thing with the New York Knicks. Twenty twelve they were beaten four to one by the Miami Heat, a uh, future NBA champions Miami Heat this year. Okay. Do you know the second uh minutes per game of that for that series of that twenty twelve team? I have no idea. Because it's Carmelo, he went he averaged I mean at, they could have had Carmelo in this movie, twenty eight and eight. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't reach out to Carmelo. I didn't see anything about Carmelo when I was looking this stuff up, so I don't know the, why. Which is but weird. No. He, he's the yeah. leading scorer in uh, three out of these five games that they played. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some uh, some beef there that we don't know about. Uh, the answer <laughs> is J.R. Smith. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> you mentioned 2012 J.R. Smith in this movie? <laughs> I feel like he would have... He tried his heart as though like him being jr and being kind of a showman and trying to like put on for the fans right it would have been so funny to watch but yeah it's it's also like when they were thinking of the star they probably didn't envision jr smith to be in this role yeah he would have uh, forgotten the score in the nba finals game he would have forgotten the score <laughs> at the end of the end of the movie and be like wait i thought i was supposed to shoot howard uh sorry <laughs> Okay, uh, this should be a quick question about the movie. Is Dabani the worst employee ever? This man does not do one thing his boss asks him to do the whole movie. Yes, he's horrible. <laughs> See, and that's another, like, relationship. Like, I don't quite get it. I knew he was – his role was to bring in clients for um, Howard. Yes. And, like – but it, it seemed like he was more of Kevin Garnett's, like – best friend than employee for howard like you said he didn't do anything that howard asked them to and then i don't know he was it was just it was so it was such a weird dynamic they had yeah so uh, that's uh out of all across all movies i think he's just terrible that i've never seen someone so bad at his job um <laughs> <laughs> another quick hitter did mike francesca or the weekend have the better cameo in the movie yeah, this is a tough one. Who do you think had the better cameo? Probably the weekend because it, it got me thinking about you know his his rise up because as we've discussed the whole movie it, 
is in like a week in the spring of 2012. And I mean, I don't know, it's yeah. only for us, I guess 2012 to me doesn't sound that long ago, but like the weekend has a pretty big rise in the last eight years. And also we watched it right before his album dropped. So I guess that helps in my mind too. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. And also, yeah, he did have a bigger role because I, even the, what was the character's name of the, like, what was his official and I forgot his name of the, the bookie. I know it was um, my Francesca, but what, is, what was his name? Oh, uh, okay. Hang on. Let me let me go back. Oh, let me. I, I I don't even know his name. I just remember him being the bookie. Let's see. His name was. Um. Why can't I? Gary. Gary. That was same. His name's Gary. So yeah. I, I think that um, Gary and because the weekend was playing himself the weekend they had I would say similar amount of screen time but the impact of the screen time was definitely bigger for the weekend just his role in the whole like bathroom scene how that played out That's and true. how that how that added to the to the drama and the crazy life that Howard was living and like nothing was going his way at that time so it definitely added to the dynamics um because the book, he, even though he was he was essential in like aiding to the gambling, I think after that the the first bet we saw was kind of um was terminated by the gambler mob guys. That's after right. After that, we didn't get to see Gary anymore, did we? No, I didn't. Because uh, they have the uh, the girlfriend go straight to the casino. Yeah. So like yeah, after that, I feel like they, if they wanted to incorporate him more, they they had the opportunity to, but. They, they probably had enough of him, so that's how I guess they got rid of that cameo by adding that drama, drama into it. So, not really sure if this movie has a moral or anything uh, in regards to that overall meaning like Parasite did that we discussed the other day. But the only thing I could come up with that was close and pertains to both of us as people who, let's just say, look into the sports betting line for certain matchups. Um, <laughs> Does this movie discourage sports gambling, and does it discourage you from sports gambling? <laughs> it does not discourage me, just because I, I was before this movie, I was aware of like how dangerous it can be and how, how crazy it gets if it's not controlled. Like I, I, I'm, I was aware of the dangers of gambling in general so this wasn't something that like was brought into like like oh crap if i if i become addicted is what happens i was aware of the addiction so it was there was no new light shined on gambling but but i could see where it could scourge some people especially if you're not if you're not if you're just getting into the scene of gambling you could be okay i need to quit because i don't want to become a character like howard did but then, in a way, also you can look at the opposite side of that. And a fresh mind that hasn't got dipped his toes into the gambling scene could be like, "Holy crap! I can win so much money by gambling, just like Howard did." Right. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, and just not get shot in the head for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, it doesn't for me either because I think you see, you, th- there's a very fine line here between what a good sports gambler would have done and what a bad sports gambler would have done and howard is a bad one that is for sure because if you for some reason found yourself in that much debt uh that howard's in this movie and you are a good sports gambler you would pay off that money as soon as you have it and in this movie there is a point as we've discussed when howard has the money to pay the people off and he has an excess of it $75,000 extra of that money and despite him having that he decides to you know bet all of it when in reality you know he could pay off the 100 uh yeah. K he owes and bet the 75,000 that's way too much money to bet kids even if you um, have that much money I don't yeah. care how confident you are <laughs> but yeah, unless, think, unless you're a billionaire but yeah. Or Dave Portnoy, um, or Dave. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the that's the difference I think here is that you know there's obviously 
with all types of gambling, obviously, it's addictive. We all know that. We're, we're both pre-med. We don't need to discuss the uh, <laughs> the mental implications of that because people a lot of times know that it's very addictive. But if, you know, it's with sports gambling especially, there's a skill to it. There is. Unlike when you're playing slots and you just uh, yeah. go ahead and push the slot button and there you go. Uh, but, you know, there, there is a, there's a rhyme or reason to it uh, with sports. So... I don't think I think it might discourage some people, but you're right. Like they do show that that amount of money uh, that he does win with millions of dollars, despite him being uh, uh, killed right afterwards. So maybe maybe some kids will get into it that uh, previously did it. So another question that kind of goes off of that: What character actually wins this movie? I will throw Good out question. there for consideration: Kevin Garnett because he gets his precious opal and he does beat the seventy sixers en route to losing to the Miami Heat in that year's Eastern Conference Finals. Julia, because she ends the movie with $1.2 million. Downside is is that she lost her hubby-bubby boyfriend. Um, yeah. Phil, I guess, because he improved his kill-death ratio by <laughs> killing two people. Um, I, don't, I don't really know. Maybe uh, Howard's wife? <laughs> yeah, because she, she doesn't have to deal with his his crap anymore so maybe yeah i don't know who, who do you think i honestly i would say probably kevin garnett just because I, I mean he he won his games and he wasn't really like involved in too much like of the dramatics as, as far as like he got he got he got the old boy he won his games he gave back the old bull and um and then he regained it again so he he gets to live his life with this opal that supposedly brings him luck and whatever. Cause the whole Julia thing, yeah, she has the money, but obviously the mob guys are still gonna try to get that money back. So I don't know if she won the movie, you know? Right. Yeah, for sure. No, I agree with you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, Kevin Garnett seems to be the one that doesn't have any downsides in this movie. I mean, maybe Damani, because he doesn't work. He doesn't have to continue faking to work for Howard anymore. And he can just be bros with Kevin Garnett. <laughs> yeah, we can look at it that way. Uh, I don't know. And you're right. Like Julia, with the $1.2 million, I mean, they are going to come after her, as they were at the end of the yeah. movie, too. So that's a good point. Yeah, maybe it's the maybe it's Howard's wife, because doesn't, she doesn't have to go through a divorce anymore. But she gets that right. nice apartment. Gets that nice apartment. That's true. Yeah. Maybe she'll but, uh, get the one point two million. I don't know how that works, but neither do I. Um, I don't know because it was under the girl's name, so never mind. She doesn't get it. That's true. Good point. I was gonna say maybe there's a uh, Jeff Bezos situation going on there. <laughs> you know what I heard the other day? Speaking of that sidetrack, is that Jeff Bezos, his wife, I don't know her name, on the account of divorcing him, or however the divorce went. I don't know who divorced who. But she is now the richest woman in the woman in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I know. Did it's for divorcing someone. I know. Like literally. I don't know. A, I, I don't know what she. I don't know what she did prior. If she. If she did. I'm sure she did something. I'm sure she was very, very um success, successful woman in her in her like time. I don't know. I don't think she was just Jeff Bezos' wife, but she's rich because she divorced Jeff. Jeff Bezos. All right, let's see. I remember that uh, I read a book about the Star of Amazon. I remember she helped out with it. Uh, oh, yeah. I, never mind. Yeah, you're right. No, yeah. I did see something like – because people people were getting defensive about that because they were giving her a hard time about, oh, yeah, you only have money because you divorced Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos and took his fortune. But some people were saying that she had – she contributed to like the the success yeah. of Amazon in a way. No, she did. Uh, okay, let's see. Mackenzie Bezos. Oh, so she, they were married before uh, Amazon. That's why she gets a bunch of it. Yeah, I don't think um, for people who defend her on Twitter, I don't think she really uh, needs it when she is now worth thirty seven billion dollars. I don't think. I don't <laughs> she think, think she need needs your tweet. I just yeah. don't think she needs it. Uh, she did graduate from Princeton, so she's obviously uh, smart, but she majored in English, so not sure how much smart she is. Stop. Um, no, it wasn't a dig. I mean, I just think, you know, maybe in the 90s it was different, but picking English as the major, I don't know. 
I don't know. That's yeah. tough. Sorry, that was very STEM major of me. That was rough. Uh, we all need to have a well-rounded education, and frankly, sometimes I don't speak English well, as you hear on the podcast. So maybe I need yeah. to major in English. There we go. Okay. Good job. <laughs> she found an anti-bullying organization. So there you go. Well, that's that, good. good. That's for worth $37 billion. Uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, before I get myself kicked off the internet... Um, <laughs> I think if we were to go to with like which actor or anything was the movie, I think Kevin Garnett has a soft win, as we've talked about. I mean, Adam Sandler, he played his character well with some range. I didn't think he had to send him anymore. Yeah, it, well, just had that in him because it's very different of, especially because of the recent movies he's put out. I know he's he had he's had similar roles like this movie, but like recently he was more diving into. A, different type of movies but this is very different and you're right i didn't think didn't think i he had this in him like you said at the start of the podcast kind of sucks he didn't win an award for this or like yeah yeah i can't i can't believe he wasn't even nominated who who ended up winning best i don't even remember see this is the thing who won best actor at the oscars let's see and while you're looking that up i also um saw the, the julia the julia girl it, this yes. was her first, her first, her first movie she acted in, and she did pretty darn good for it being her first movie. Yeah, I didn't think that would be her first movie. Wow. Yeah. Let's hold on. Oh, it was a. Uh, it's Joaquin Phoenix from The Joker. Oh, yeah. oh that makes sense. Yeah, but uh, that's tough. That's tough. I'm break, uh, We're gonna have the Joker review pod on Friday, so maybe we'll have a, a longer discussion about uh, <laughs> if he or uh, Adam Sandler should have won that award. So, okay. So, last question I have here that we can talk about whatever we want. Is the movie rewatchable? And usually when you have movies like this that, you know, we talk about with this level of depth and they're this interesting, the answer is always yes. I'm not so sure about this one. What do you think? No, yeah, you're right. I don't – because especially you kind of have to – I don't know, the the people that listen to this podcast probably seen already, but, like, they understand how – how like it develops and how all this like small little actions and like fast pacedness of this movie really contributes to the outcome of it. And I don't know if, if you can sit there and watch it and re- relive all that dramatics. You it won't be the same. Like it probably you could probably like get maybe watch it one more time if 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 anything, but definitely not like three times. Right, yeah, I agree with you. I think I said it uh, yesterday when we recorded our Parasite podcast. I think the way that you know how it ends kind of doesn't take it out of the storyline, obviously, because I think you're right. You'll be able to pick up a couple things each time you you watch it. Again, you know, it's so chaotic, in the especially in the first hour or so, but you'll be able to pick up some different things from then. But for you know the the end of the movie and such like that, I I don't think it's that rewatchable per se. Just because uh, there's you know how it ends, you know he gets shot in the head, you know it doesn't work out, and I think that's one of the main you know uh, things to this movie that makes it great in the end is that. You know, you think you have an idea of where it ends all the way up to the last three minutes, and then it stuns you just like that. Yeah. No, yeah, I agree. So would you recommend this movie? Yeah, I would definitely recommend this movie. It's a great movie. I agree completely. Truly uh, one of M. Sandler's best performances uh, when he's not being a big old dad like he is in all of his other comedic movies. Yeah. So, other note, uh, Leo DiCaprio got a nomination for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and uh, Adam did it for this movie. It's interesting. Yeah, and we watch those movies like within a few days of apart. So, I think Adam definitely deserved to be nominated over yeah. over Leo. I think it's. I don't know. I agree with you, a hundred percent. I do, but yeah. Is there anything we missed that you would like to discuss? I don't know if we missed anything, but I wanted to add something just for, I don't know, like content, I guess. So I was looking at like just reviews of this movie and then I saw that the the um, 
the Safdie brothers, they they wanted to make sure like this movie paralleled real life a lot. So the whole the stats lining up with Kevin Garnett that was all done for like on purpose. It was um, everything they did. It even like they had stuff that was in real life. Like I didn't pick this up watching the movie, but like jewelry stores that were that he went into when like pawned. Um, his stuff there, there, those are actual jewelry stores in New York City in the Diamond District that you can walk into. Oh, really? And other, yeah, and then other stuff like that is that is very real life, and people that are in the Diamond District can attest to this. Is the whole like, and I kind of knew this from like being in like a big NBA fan and all these like NBA stars and rappers. They love their iced out watches and their jewelry, so they do they do have these people like liaisons that bring him into the diamond district and these like little jewelers to like get a new watch and get a new thing and and anytime like a team plays in new york city you can probably find an nba star in the diamond district trying to get like the next rarest piece of jewelry so like this all this stuff makes sense the only like one thing that is probably not common amongst all Diamond District drawers is the fact like they have a gambling problem, but everything else was like right on point with real life. That's pretty cool, and I feel like that gives you know throughout the movie you feel a real authenticity of the whole movie. You don't yeah. feel like anything's fake. You don't feel like there's these giant CGI pieces and such. And obviously, exactly. I stated at the beginning the uh, the movie's budget reflects that, but it still adds to the whole. I uh, think in contrast with the whole mystical element of this uh, gem that Kevin Garnett is transfixed by and plays amazing uh, when he when he has it. There's even the the halftime thing, right? They're losing and he's just staring into its eye, into the gem. Yeah. It's just like, okay, this is uh, this is intense. <laughs> but you're right. The rest of the movie is very realistic, and I think it's really cool. Uh, I had no clue about any of that. I'm not I'm not big into the uh, into the scene of that like you are. So. <laughs> the culture. Yeah, yeah, not into the culture, as a, as I'm sure people know now. <laughs> <laughs> no, now that you have some Yeezy, I don't know about that, Zach. That's you true. You might be getting into the culture. That's true. Uh, it's getting better. I, uh, Katie's dad is a big shoe guy, and uh, I think he was impressed when I went over his house and uh, That's showed good. him off before our, for our isolation. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know a thing or two. <laughs> but yeah, so, okay. Anything else to add here before we... Before we wrap up and I go back to sitting in my house. No, 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 I don't have anything else. I think that was pretty much it. Awesome. Well, Sal, thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Stay safe. Uh, I would say out there, but inside your home and in your car. Stay safe. Thank you, Zach. Yes, you stay safe as well inside <laughs> all your Zoom lectures. Don't forget to turn off the camera when you go to the bathroom. That's right. And all yeah, that and stuff. That- in the microphone. I saw my religion yeah. professor's husband twice today uh, to help her with oh. issues. It's fantastic. Truly fantastic. It's funny. But uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Take care, everyone.